Again, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the book of the prophet Joel. We're going to be in chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 18 tonight as we continue our study through the minor prophets. Uh, if you remember from the last couple of weeks, the theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. Uh, and, and Joel is the first of the prophets to use that term. And it's found five times in Joel. It's found 75 times in the Bible. And the term is a reference to the tribulation period and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, the key verse uh, is Joel 115. And again, key verses, you, you got to know that key verse is kind of the one you pick out yourself. Somebody else might have another key verse, but this is the one that I think is probably key to the, the book of Joel, uh, which is Joel 115. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. You know, it's interesting, and we talked about this last week, uh, that the day of the Lord is at hand, and the day of the Lord shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Isn't that interesting? That the prophet saw it as being here and yet still yet future. Because there were some aspects about the day of the Lord that were occurring in the very day that he made this prophecy. And yet that future day is still to come. So there is a, a, a present fulfillment and a far fulfillment of prophecy. So often the prophets, as they looked across the corridor of time through prophecy, what they saw were mountain peaks. What they didn't see was the valley of time between the mountain peaks, you see. And so when the prophet often prophesied, he saw these events as being connected or contiguous. He did not see the valley of time between some of these aspects of prophecy. And, and that's just how it was. I mean, he was looking from a certain vantage point. Uh, today, as we say, hindsight is 2020. We're looking back. We see those valleys of time, whereas the prophet looking forward couldn't see them. Now, it's likely that Joel was the very first of the writing prophets. Uh, there were other prophets who were written about, but Joel was probably the first one to write down a prophecy himself. Maybe Obadiah was, but it's between Joel and Obadiah. Now, due to the references we find to the temple uh, in Jerusalem, his ministry was likely to the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, and again, specifically to the city of Jerusalem and the area of Jerusalem. Uh, it's likely also that Joel was a contemporary prophet of Elijah and Elisha. Remember, Joel was ministering to the southern kingdom of Judah. The kingdom was split in two uh, after Solomon's death. And Joel was in the southern kingdom ministering, whereas Elijah and Elisha were in the northern kingdom that was called Israel uh, for their ministry. So he was probably a contemporary of Elijah and Elisha. Now the setting of this prophecy was that a local uh, plague of locusts had descended upon the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, it was unlike any that they had ever seen before. Uh, it was a plague of biblical proportions. It wiped out everything. Uh, and this plague was a judgment of the Lord against Judah for their sins. Now, while this plague was local, the prophet uses this plague to expound upon the coming day of the Lord, uh, a term that's used to speak about the tribulation period that will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, as is often the case in Old Testament prophecy, a local event is a model or a type of a coming future event. Uh, this is the case here as, as Joel weaves in and out of events both local and future. So it's best to see that Joel uses the plague of locusts, which was a present event, to speak prophetically about the coming judgments of God that are associated with the day of the Lord, which are yet future. In chapter 1, the prophet described this plague. 
which was accompanied, by the way, by a drought and also by wildfires. So the land, the land was devastated. Its agriculture was consumed completely. Without a doubt, it was God's hand of judgment upon this disobedient nation. And we as a nation ought to take note when we see that. In chapter 2, we then read the remedy for their sins. It said, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So they needed personal and national repentance. Now the remainder of chapter 2 then shows us what blessings will result when they repent and turn back to the Lord. So let's get started. If you're not already there, turn with me in your Bibles to Joel chapter 2, starting in verses 18 and 19. Then the Lord, so then is then after they repent, then after they turn back to the Lord, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Now again, as I mentioned, beginning in verse uh, 12 of chapter 2, the Lord gave instructions uh, to Judah on how to avert disaster, how to... Uh, end this plague uh, that was upon them. He said, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me. Turn back to God. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. In other words, get serious with the Lord. Repent from your heart, not just, not just your outward actions. In fact, he says, uh, uh, so rend your, your heart and not your garments. Because the, the, the rending of the garments was a, a sign, an outward sign of grief and mourning. But you could tear your garments and have no change in your heart, amen? Yeah. You could do the outward stuff. You could kneel, you could bow, you could fall down, you could raise your hands, whatever that outward thing might be. But if it's not coming from the heart, then it's not the genuine article. It's just an outward act and not an inward work. God desires a work in the inner man. Amen? Amen? And that's what he wanted for Judah, was an inner work. Now, beginning uh, here in verse 18, we see the results of Judah's repentance, what it, what it would be if they repented. First, it says that God would look again with favor on his land and on his people. So then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. So God would look again with favor upon them. Second, he would answer their prayers. It says the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. So their prayers, their prayers for deliverance from the results of the locust plague, uh, the drought and the wildfires, their prayers would be answered. Their agriculture, you see, would be restored. God would satisfy his people with food again. Third, they would no longer be looked down upon by the surrounding nations. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. You know, I, I read that and I wonder, I wonder what the nations of the world think when they look at our nation right now. Are we a reproach among the nations? They see the ridiculousness uh, I mean, we're so woke, we're sound asleep, amen? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just the, 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 the insanity that's going on in our nation. I wonder if we're a reproach among the nations as well. But you know, when you repent, God will take that away. He'll take that away from you. You know, whenever God's people repent and turn back to the Lord, He restores His good favor to them. They begin to enjoy God's blessings instead of God's curses. And it will be like that for Judah, and it will be like that for us, not only as a nation, but for us individually. When, when we have stumbled, when we have uh, turned away from the Lord, when we turn back to the Lord, we will again enjoy God's favor. Now look at verse 20. 
But I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will arise because he has done monstrous or great things. Now, as, as I mentioned, this prophecy of Joel's uh, has numerous uh, applications, as it were. In fact, three applications. Uh, and Joel weaves in and out of these three effortless, effortlessly. I can't even say that. Joel can do it. I can't even say it. Now, the first was the plague of locusts described in terms uh, like a conquering army. The second, there actually was a conquering army. The Assyrians were on the rise. They were threatening the northern kingdom of Israel at this time. And third, there will be a future attack by a confederation of nations led by a northern kingdom whom we believe to be Russia, according to Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. In fact, turn back in your Bible, would you, to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel 38. Look at verse 2, where these nations are mentioned. Here's the nations. Uh, Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And, and many associate those Three, uh, Rosh with Russia, Meshach with uh, Moscow, and Tubal with Tbilisk, all big cities, important cities in uh, Russia itself. Uh, look at verse 5. Uh, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. So they join this group. Now look at verse 6. Gomer, Togarma from the far north. Uh, they're also associated with this group, this confederation. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 2. I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north. Uh, in fact, if you look on a map and, and look directly north of Israel, if you take the map and look just straight north of Israel, you, you run right into Russia. In fact, just about end up in Moscow if you go straight north from Israel. They're certainly the farthest to the north in relation to Israel of any nation. If you go any further than that, you're in the Arctic, right? So, I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north, not the near north, but the far north again, <clears throat> and bring you against the mountains of Israel. So, these nations will come up against Israel in the last days. But if Judah repents, then God is going to drive these armies away. And we know uh, that the swarm of locusts were indeed driven away. We also know that the Assyrian army was driven away. Uh, later, the Babylonians uh, conquered Judah. Uh, but we also know that in the future, God will defeat this Russian-led confederation and drive them away according to Ezekiel uh, 39. Look at, look at Ezekiel 39 verses 3 through 5. It says, Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open Field. So in other words, they don't even get into the city. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. So not only will the locusts and Assyrians be defeated if Israel repents, but this great last days northern-led confederation as well. And, and there is so much we could say about Ezekiel 38 and 39. But uh, that prophet is not the focus of our study here. Uh, someday we'll go through that book if the Lord tarries. Amen? Look now at verses 21 and 22 back in Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord has done marvelous things. 
Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree uh, bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Now back in chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, we saw that wildfire had consumed all the open pasture uh, that the wild beasts, uh, the undomesticated animals, depended on. Here, when Judah repents, God promises that even the beasts of the field will then find the open pastures springing up again. And, and I mentioned this last week and said that you know, all sin, even secret sin, affects others. Sometimes we th like to think that our sin doesn't affect anybody else. Uh, but it does, and I've seen more than one family torn apart because of the sins of one member. Uh, but here we also see that the land and even the animals were all, not only were they affected by Judah's sin, but likewise, they will be affected by Judah's repentance. So because of Judah's sin, the open pastures were burned up. The, even the beasts of the field were suffering because of Judah's sin. Their sin affected even the wild animals. Isn't that, isn't that amazing to think of it? But also, Judah's repentance brought blessing to the wild beasts of the field. The open pastures began to spring up again. And that's just amazing when you think about it, you know? Our sin affects others, but our repentance will also be a blessing to others. Amen? Now look at verses 23 and 24. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain, that's in October, and the latter rain in the first month, that's about April, uh, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. In chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, and in 17 through 18, we saw that a great drought was sent by the Lord against Judah. But again, when Judah repents, the rains return. Uh, maybe that's why we haven't had any rain in April yet. <laughs> our, our state needs to repent, amen? Amen. Ancient Israel was dependent upon the rain for their crops. They didn't have modern irrigation. And since the rain comes from God, they were dependent, you see, on the Lord for their crops. Uh, the former rain came in what we would call October. Uh, the latter rain came in the spring, what we would call uh, April on our calendar. And when Judah repented, uh, these rains returned, and, and thus their crops and their harvest would return. Uh, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Uh, remember, I mean, these locusts came in, and as we read uh, in chapter 1, these locusts stayed through, the, they last about three or four months, but apparently they stayed and ate everything in sight. Because we have a description of, of crawling locusts, consuming locusts, chewing locusts, swarming locusts. And, and that basically describes all the life stages uh, of the locusts. So they flew into Judah and they stayed in Judah. They didn't move on and then they ate everything in sight. And that was followed by a drought. And the drought was followed by wildfires. Their entire agricultural production was destroyed. But when they repent... Then God returns to them these things. Their threshing floors are going to be full of wheat again. Vats are going to be overflowing with new wine and oil. So as a result, joy and gladness return to the people of Judah. You see, God was just waiting to bless them, to pour out his goodness upon them. And God is just as anxious to bless us and pour out his blessings upon us. Sometimes our sin stands in the way. The way of enjoying the goodness of God. And like Judah, we then need to repent. Need to turn to God with all our heart. 
and if necessary, with fasting and weeping and mourning. We need to get serious with the Lord. And when we do, God's goodness and blessing returns to our lives. Now, now I'm not talking, by the way, about losing our salvation. But we can lose the sweetness of close fellowship with the Lord. We can lose the many blessings that result from that close and abiding relationship. Uh, you know, I've, I've described it to you before, but, you know, as a believer, we, we don't lose our salvation, but we can lose that close relationship with the Lord. Amen? You know, I, I've got a brother, and, and if I offend him, usually it's the other way around, but if I offend him, you know, you know our relationship was broken. Until I get on the phone and call him up and make things right. Now, during that time that our relationship was broken, I never ceased being his brother, you see. We still had that family relationship, but there wasn't that closeness until there was repentance, until there was a making it right, you see. And the same thing is true with our relationship with God. We don't get kicked out of the family of God because we've stumbled, amen? Because most of us would get kicked out several times a day. <laughs> but we lose that, that intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior. We lose out on the many blessings He wants to pour out on our lives when we fall into sin. And so when we repent, God returns those things to us. Look at verse 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army which I sent among you. The locust had consumed so much of Israel's agriculture that it would take years for their economy to recover. It would look as if an invading army had destroyed everything in sight. But here, God promises to supernaturally restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. In other words, it's not going to take years for your harvest to recover. I'm going to restore it to you. You know, as a young man and, and young believer, I had disobeyed the Lord. And, and I found myself in the same place as Judah. The locust had consumed everything in my life. Uh, one day, I was living up in North Idaho at the time. One day I was out helping a, a brother in Christ. He was an older gentleman, he and his wife. and uh, I was out helping him pull stumps and clear some trees on his property uh, out near Athol, uh, north of Coeur d'Alene and Hayden Lake. And we're out there just working and we're clearing stumps and we're fellowshipping and hanging out. And this brother, all of a sudden his brother just turns to me and he looks at me and he says, Rob, he says, God is going to restore to you all that the canker worm has eaten. And then he turned back around and went back to pulling stumps. But, but that was God's word to my heart. I mean, I received it as such. When he spoke it, I knew God was speaking through him to me by his word. And, and, and I hid that in my heart and I watched God begin to work and restore, again, all that the canker worm had eaten in my life life. And, uh, you know, when we turn back to the Lord, we can expect God to turn back to us. Amen. The Bible says in James 4, 8, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We, he's just waiting. It's like the, the father waiting for the prodigal son to come back. And when the son turned and started heading back, the father ran out to meet him and, and embraced him. And God is just waiting at times for us to do the same thing, for us to turn and come back so he can put his arms around us and welcome us home. And, and, he, and, and what did the, the, the father do to the prodigal son? He put a robe on him and he put a ring on his finger. He had blessings for that son. And he has blessings for us when we repent and turn as well. Amen? Isn't that wonderful just to, just to take the time to think about that? How wonderful God is and how much He wants to bless us. God loves us. Amen? He loves us in spite of us. <laughs> now look at verses 26 and 27. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. 
and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Before, in their sin, Judah was starving. But in their repentance, God says, You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And as a result of God's goodness, they were going to praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. In addition, the reproach of the nations would also be removed. My people shall never be put to shame. Now that speaks of their temporary reprieve, but also of their coming state in the millennial kingdom. So this prophecy was fulfilled temporarily, but it will be fulfilled to its greatest degree in the future in the millennial kingdom. Now look at verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. That's how you know, by the way, whether you're old or young. <laughs> and also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So now the prophet Joel jumps ahead in this prophecy to the inauguration of the church on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, Peter quotes this verse in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. And he quotes it to describe what had just happened to the disciples in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell. The crowd thought that they were drunk with wine. But Peter explained it as the fulfillment of this verse when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church and gifted the church to carry on the ministry of the Lord. In Acts 2.16, Peter said this. He said, but this, what they were hearing and seeing, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Then he quoted this very text of Scripture. Now, I want, to, I, I want you to notice a couple of things here. First, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. In the Old Testament, God put his spirit on certain men, such as kings and prophets. He also did so for a specific uh, event and a specific time. But now, God pours out his spirit on each and every believer, Jew and Gentile, and his spirit remains upon us. He, the Holy Spirit, you see, indwells us. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Nobody is excluded, you see. Also, God does not discriminate on gender. It says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He also does not discriminate on age. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And neither does God discriminate on social position. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. You see that? God is not going to, in this time in which we live, God is not discriminating in any way. He's going to pour out His Spirit upon each and every person that comes to faith in Christ. Man, woman, uh, young, old, uh, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. He's going to pour out His Spirit upon all. God promises Judah and the world that the new day was coming, a day when God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh, and that day is today. That day is now started on the day of Pentecost. But Peter goes on to quote the remainder of Joel's prophecy found in the next verses. Both Joel and Peter prophesy of a coming future day of judgment called the day of the Lord. And I want you to note for Israel, for Judah, it was future. For the church, 
according to Peter, it's also future. It's a day after the church age is over. It's a day that takes place after the rapture of the church to heaven. Look at verses 30 and 31. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great an awesome day of the Lord. So there is coming a great and awesome day of the Lord. There's coming a future day, you see. Right now we're reading about these coming events in the book of Revelation. These events will transpire during the seven-year tribulation period after the age of the church is over. The church will be raptured to heaven and the seven-year tribulation period will commence when? According to Daniel 9, 27, the coming Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. A peace treaty that he will break in the middle of that period of time. So both Joel and Peter agree that there is coming a great and awesome day of the Lord. There's coming a day, a future day of God's judgment. It was future in Joel's day, and it was future to Peter for the church. And the day of the Lord is a day of darkness. It's not a day of, of, of light. It's not a picnic. It will begin with God's wrath being poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. In fact, in the book of Revelation, uh, if we were calculating uh, the numbers correctly, by the middle of the tribulation period, half of earth's population has perished in the tribulation already and that's like what there's almost four billion people perish in the first half the first three and a half years of the tribulation period and that's only going to escalate until christ himself returns to defeat his enemies and set up his kingdom it is then at the return of Christ, that we, the church, return with Christ. The Bible says to rule and reign on earth for a thousand years. I can't even get my mind around that. Can you imagine ruling and reigning with Christ? I mean, maybe I'll get to run the town of Gerlach. <laughs> if I'm lucky, you know. Now, if you want more information on that, then watch our YouTube series on Revelation. Uh, this coming Sunday, we're going to be in chapter 16, a chapter which begins to describe the final seven bowls of God's wrath poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. And again, this, it, 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 if you thought it was getting bad uh, before, now God's judgments are really going to get bad. So don't miss out this Sunday. Now look at verse 32, our final verse this evening. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that a great verse? Isn't that great? For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So not only will believing Israel be saved, but whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. Whoever calls upon Christ's name. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to do some great thing. You don't have to impress the Lord. We sang that song, come just as you are. Amen? Amen. Come just as, that's what you do. You come just, you bring your baggage, you bring your stuff, you just come. Come just as you are and let God clean up the mess. Amen? <laughs> you gotta love that. You gotta love it. God calls us out of this world into his kingdom. In addition, there's going to be a believing remnant of Israel whom the Lord calls. In the last days, we're told that a third of Israel will come to faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Uh, Two-thirds of Israel will perish 
but one third will come through the tribulation. They will receive Christ. They rejected him at his first coming, but they will receive him at his second coming. Amen? Amen. Now we can be sure, just like Judah could be sure, that if we've sinned, if we have fallen out of favor with the Lord, the path back to God's favor and blessing is to turn to him with all our hearts. Amen? Then God will restore to us the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, his great army which he sent among us. And we will again enjoy God's bounty and blessing in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we so, so thank you. You are so good to us, and, and your promises are so good. Even as we read uh, through this chapter in Joel, and we see these principles, Lord, the principles of, of, of repentance and blessing, Lord, that comes as a result of that. God, may each and every one of us not forget those lessons. It may be, Lord, that those lessons apply today, and it may be that those lessons will apply someday in our lives, a day when we need to turn back to you with all our heart. So, God, may we not forget these wonderful lessons that you've taught us this evening. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.